Since the last film report, the broad pattern of the challenge to United States defense policy has continued to come into focus. Every man in the United States Air Force should understand by now that the conflict between the United States and the Communists has no end in sight. It is also clear that what the future holds is uncertain. Considering the rate of social and technical change of this century, even the best qualified planners have a difficult time predicting the international alignments, the specific objectives, and the specific threat that will influence United States policy even as close as 10 years from now. SAC has learned this lesson over two decades of rapid change, and we are continuing to recognize its implications today. In short, SAC is keeping strong, facing the military environment realistically, and carrying out our assigned mission with what we are given. SAC's weapon system modernization program illustrates this fact. Beginning in fiscal year 69, SAC will receive the FB-111 as a replacement system for the earlier model B-52s. By fiscal year 72, the command will have seven operational FB-111 wings with 263 aircraft. The total number includes spares and attrition aircraft. There will be no major organizational changes connected with the FB-111, and each wing will have approximately 4,000 personnel. Minuteman modernization is also well underway. All present Minuteman I missiles will be eventually replaced with the improved F model, which has a 360-degree azimuth and the capability of hitting any one of eight targets. This will give SAC's entire Minuteman force the same operational capability as Wing 6 at Grand Forks Air Force Base by February 1972. The continuing Minuteman education program is a program for modernizing Air Force professional manpower. It carries the added advantage for SAC of attracting high-quality volunteers to Minuteman combat crews. Two important phases in modernizing SAC's strategic reconnaissance are also now in progress. First, SAC SR-71 crews and support elements at Beale Air Force Base are in intensive training. The SR-71 is a highly automated aircraft with extraordinary performance and promising growth potential. Second, 10 RC-135s are now entering the inventory. Equipped with fan jet engines, these aircraft are a big step in the continued modernizing of SAC's inventory of combat aircraft. While SAC's 20th anniversary has been a good time to review our record, the important view today, as always, this forward. SAC's mission is clear. The scientific studies continue. Technical progress will provide us with effective weapons. I am confident that each of you will be flexible and professional enough to make good use of them. January 17th, at 0925 Zulu time, a B-52 from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina, and a KC-135, reflexed from Blytheville Air Force Base, Arkansas, collided during an in-flight refueling operation and crashed near Pueblo Palomares, a Spanish farming community on the Mediterranean coast. Wreckage, including four nuclear weapons, was strewn over the countryside and into the Mediterranean Sea. An immediate job was to locate the nuclear weapons, as a disaster of this magnitude calls for quick and decisive action if serious international consequences are to be averted. Within hours, disaster control groups from Torrejon and Moron air bases in Spain arrived at the scene. The next day, military personnel from other European bases and from the United States arrived to assist in locating the wreckage. Searchers found the first bomb intact by sundown of the day of the accident. A short time later, two more were found. Their high explosive charges had detonated, scattering pieces of the bombs over a considerable area. 
There was no danger of nuclear explosion due to safeguards built into the system. There were plutonium particles scattered over a wide area which had to be removed from the country. Recovery of the B-52 combat mission folder also claimed top priority since it would have revealed GO codes and mission targets. But two days after the crash, it was determined that the folder had been destroyed by fire. Major aircraft components were soon recovered and examined. Then the search continued for bits and pieces. To support the activity, which continued about three months, a base camp was set up, complete with command post, administrative branch, housing, messing, laundry facilities, motor pool, communications, and specialized equipment. Helicopter service was established to the nearest landing field, a Spanish air base about 80 miles away. At the height of the activity, over 100 disaster control team members, assisted by about 700 other personnel, participated in the search. The disaster control team identified contaminated areas over 650 acres and located hot spots within those areas. Greatest amount of contamination was found in the craters caused by the detonation of conventional high explosive material contained in the weapons. Decontamination was accomplished and every building in Palomares with a trace of contamination was washed down and painted. The Navy also assisted in the search for debris and for the fourth bomb which was not located until weeks later. Scuba divers swimming underwater in close formation surveyed the ocean bottom immediately offshore. When the fourth and missing weapon could not be located on land or immediately offshore, the Navy extended the search to deep water with underwater search vehicles shipped from the United States. Contaminated vegetation and crops were chopped up or burned. The United States bought literally tons of tomatoes from nearby farms, which were thoroughly washed and then safely served to American military personnel. This helped to convince local residents that their crops had not been destroyed by contamination. Contaminated material, chopped up vegetation and soil, was placed in 55-gallon drums. About 5,000 of them were filled, sealed by welding, and prepared for shipment to the United States where they were interred in the Atomic Energy Commission burial ground near Aiken, South Carolina. In the meantime, a pier was built at Palomares and over 200,000 pounds of uncontaminated scrap metal from the damaged aircraft was loaded onto barges and later dumped in deep water well away from Atlantic shipping lanes. In three months, the job was completed. The fourth bomb was located by the Navy in deep water offshore and recovered. The last contaminated materials were placed on ships and transported to their final resting place. Throughout the entire operation, the Air Force and host country worked together in harmony. The Spanish government agreed on the decontamination procedures used and its civil police guarded vital areas and assisted in the cleanup. A disaster that had threatened serious international complications had been resolved by swift and decisive action. In March, SAC deployed the 28th Bomb Wing at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, and the 484th Bomb Wing at Turner Air Force Base, Georgia, to Guam, in support of the ground operations in Vietnam. Almost 1,700, including flight crews and support personnel, were involved in the move, which was on a six-month TDY basis. The deployment posed a formidable logistics problem. Several hundred tons of freight had to be moved, from spare aircraft engines and spare parts to specialized equipment not available at Guam, even administrative forms and office fixtures. Bombers had to be scheduled for orderly departure. So did the KC-135 transports, which flew support personnel, their baggage and equipment to the forward operating base. Also before departure, personal problems had to be taken care of, allotments for dependents so families would be provided for during the absence, income tax reports prepared and filed with internal revenue, and other details. 
At Guam, both wings were designated as the 4133rd Bomb Wing Provisional. The deployment was the third on a TDY basis in support of operations in Southeast Asia since August 1965. To add firepower in support of the Vietnam ground forces, the bombers had to be given a tactical and saturation bombing capability. Bomb bays were modified to carry 84 500 pound bombs plus 24 external 750 pound bombs for a total of 60,000 pounds per mission. Departing crews were briefed on weather and routes, on refueling areas and schedules, and on position and tactical reporting procedures. The two wings were preceded by the 454th Bomb Wing, Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi, and the 320th Bomb Wing, Mather Air Force Base, California, which in turn had replaced the 7th Bomb Wing, Carswell Air Force Base, Texas. Both the 28th and 484th, after flying almost daily missions against the Viet Cong, returned to their home stations following the temporary duty. Fortresses like these returned to Anderson after bombing an enemy troop concentration 70 miles northwest of Saigon in Tainan province. The raid marked one year of strikes against VC targets. During the year since they first struck a suspected enemy troop concentration and storage area about 30 miles north-northwest of Saigon, more than 350 strikes were flown. Then, on April 12th, the big bombers struck for the first time in North Vietnam, when crews bombed approaches to the Mu Gia Pass. Meantime, to update its capability to support Southeast Asia arc light operations, SAC undertook an extensive construction program. At Anderson alone, the command spent ten and one half million dollars on housing and runway improvements. Originally planned for 1,000 men, a 14-unit, 1,400-man troop camp was rushed to completion. Each unit, which can accommodate 100 men, was built in the form of an H, with a cross-section housing a laundry room, shower and drying rooms, and wash facilities. Two administration buildings are scheduled for completion by mid-October. To accommodate the B-52 force, the north runway was extended from 8,500 to over 11,000 feet. The center taxiway was widened, and parking stubs were added to park the big bombers. In all, Anderson now has basic parking facilities for 70 aircraft. Also, six new bomb preload facilities were constructed. At Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, another $14 million was spent to provide greater capability for the tanker force based there. Projects included a new four and one half million dollar runway extension, more parking spaces for aircraft, greater POL facilities, a wing headquarters, and a command and control post. During the same period, SAC moved to transfer Tiger Cub and Young Tiger refueling operations to a new wing, the 4258 Strategic Wing, which was activated June 2nd at Banyu Tapao, Thailand. The 4258 will have a detachment at Takli Air Base, Thailand. Complete overall strength of more than 1,000 personnel with 25 KC-135 tankers based at Banyu Tapao and 10 at Takli is programmed for January 1st, 1967. Under the realignment, the 4252nd Strategic Wing at Kadena will service primarily arc light refuelings. The shuffling of forces meant that new facilities had to be developed to support the Tiger Cub and Young Tiger operations. At Takli, it included more housing and the expansion of existing facilities. But at Banyu Tapao, it meant building an entire base from scratch. 
Completion date is scheduled for early 1967. This and other construction is enabling SAC to give even more effective support to ground forces in Vietnam. How effective this support is was testified to by Army General William C. Westmoreland on a recent visit to Anderson with Major General William J. Crum, commander of the 3rd Air Division. The commander of U.S. military forces in Vietnam told SAC ground and flight crews that their efforts had enhanced the morale of South Vietnamese and American troops and drastically hurt the morale of the enemy because he is no longer safe anywhere. During his visit, General Westmoreland inspected some of the big-bellied B-52s and their flying and ground crews on the flight line and then spoke to members of the division's staff, maintenance, and support personnel. Before SAC started its bombing missions a year ago, the general said, the Viet Cong had sanctuaries he could operate in and out of without being touched. These demanded saturation area-type bombings and you are the people who could deliver the goods. And you have in magnificent fashion. Even as General Westmoreland inspected 3rd Air Division headquarters, Stratofortress crews continued to prepare aircraft for daily strikes against Vietnam targets. Beside the six additional preload facilities constructed at Anderson, revetments were built around the preloading areas as a safety precaution to contain any accidental conventional explosion should one occur. To give greater mission flexibility, bomb bays are capable of carrying either nuclear or conventional weapons as the requirement might demand. So that SAC's mighty deterrent force would not be degraded, some of the big bombers, loaded with nuclear weapons, stood runway alert. Others took on their loads of conventional 500, 750, and 1,000 pound iron bombs. Each day, bomber and tanker crews receive briefings on their missions. The firepower SAC bombers are delivering against the foe exceeds by two and one half times the monthly average of the three-year Korean War. Exact evaluation of the strikes sometimes is difficult because of the nature of the terrain struck. But as the raids continue, mounting evidence indicates a devastating effect both on the enemy's morale and his ability to wage war. At dark, the B-52s take off on a precise time schedule, each carrying 60,000 pounds of bombs. They will release their weapons from an altitude of from 26,000 to 35,000 feet while traveling at 440 knots, completing the round trip back to Anderson in 11 and one half hours. As Deputy Secretary of Defense Cyrus R. Vance said recently, these B-52s are a concrete example of our determination to give our fighting men everything they need to do the job. In March 1966, in conjunction with other Air Force agencies and the Atomic Energy Commission, SAC continued testing the reliability of stockpiled nuclear weapon systems under a program nicknamed Mixed Marble. Seven denuclearized bombs and one AGM-28 Hound Dog missile were tested. Combat crews from each of SAC's numbered air forces are selected to make the tests. All participating aircraft come off ground alert and no special maintenance is performed. Crews fly typical EWO mission profiles prior to the drops. The mixed marble program was initiated by SINC-SAC and conforms with the International Test Ban Treaty prohibiting tests involving nuclear explosions which could contaminate the atmosphere. Each bomb tested is taken from the operational stockpile and transported to an AEC modification facility. There, nuclear components are removed and the weapon is given a mission code name which is printed on the bomb. An instrumentation package is installed to enable the AEC to perform a post-mortem analysis of the drop. Bombs tested are representative of the entire nuclear inventory. All normal checklist procedures are used for weapon loading and delivery. In this particular test, the Mark 53 weapon is loaded aboard a B-52 at McCoy Air Force Base, Florida. Tests are held at the Tonopah Test Range, Nevada. 
During the mixed marble program, all bomb delivery modes are tested. Lay down, as shown here, free fall ground and air bursts, low altitude retarded air bursts, and high altitude retarded air bursts. Also, delivery tactics are tested, such as the pup maneuver for lay down and the short look maneuver. All objectives of the tests were achieved. As part of SAC's continuing operational test program for ICBMs, personnel and missiles are selected to participate in actual launches at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. Missile combat crews from the 341st Strategic Missile Wing, Maelstrom Air Force Base, Montana, had the distinction of participating in the first salvo launch of two Minuteman missiles in February. Missiles for the launch were selected from those on actual alert at Maelstrom and were airlifted to Vandenberg. All nuclear components were removed and combat training launch instrumentation kits with range safety destruct capabilities were added to monitor the missile functions. Several miles separated the two missile combat crews. After receipt and authentication of the launch execution message, the crews started down their launch checklists. The salvo launch was designed to evaluate multiple firing techniques which could be used at all operational bases under actual combat conditions. At a certain point on the checklist, the crew commander calls the other missile combat crew to coordinate their actions. Then, observing the two-man concept to guard against inadvertent launch, they turn the keys to start the automatic terminal countdown. The two solid fuel missiles blasted simultaneously from their underground silos for their 5,000-mile, 27-minute flight down the Air Force Western Test Range. Both impacted in the target area in the Enowetok Lagoon. Detachment 1 of the Air Force Western Test Range scored the launches and recovered the re-entry vehicles, which were sent to the San Antonio Air Materiel Area for analysis. The Salvo missiles were the 111th and 112th Minuteman ICBMs to be launched on the Air Force Western Test Range. This year, the Strategic Air Command's 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base, California, received the first operational models of the triple sonic high-altitude SR-71. This advanced high-performance reconnaissance aircraft was designed by Kelly Johnson, designer of several famed aircraft, the F-80 Shooting Star, the first U.S. operational jet, and the U-2. A sister ship of the YF-12A, a prototype interceptor now being tested, the SR-71 was developed by Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. The SR-71 carries a two-man crew, a pilot and a reconnaissance systems operator. Appropriately, the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, which flies SAC's newest aircraft, is a lineal descendant of the Air Force's oldest unit, the 1st Aero Squadron, also a reconnaissance unit. After high-speed landings, cooling fans have to be used on the tires as part of the recovery operation. The composite wing headquarters building is under tight security. Here, missions are drawn on strip maps which are pasted together. Pre-computed performance data is indicated on tabs placed along the route. Then they are photographed on 35 millimeter color film. During the flight, the film is projected in the cockpit. Its speed synchronized with the ground speed by the system's operator. The SR-71 is well adapted to its role. Its reconnaissance systems vary in required capabilities. Categories range from simple battlefield surveillance to multiple sensor reconnaissance, and from high performance systems for interdiction reconnaissance to strategic systems for specialized surveillance over large areas of the world.
Because its ceiling is over 80,000 feet and its speed Mach 3, crewmen must wear flight suits similar to those worn by Gemini astronauts, pressurized and environmentally controlled. Several liners in the suit allow for air circulation and at the same time hold pressurization. The outer garment is heat reflecting aluminized cloth that provides protection for the crew. Special care is taken to ensure proper fitting of the helmet and the rubberized facial seal. Oxygen is received from the aircraft or through a self-contained emergency oxygen system. After suiting up, the crew is transported to the SR-71 hangar in an air-conditioned van. Attending them are two physiological services technicians and a doctor who evaluate any last-minute complaints by either crew member. Each of the crew goes on a high-protein, low-residue diet prior to the flight. Body temperature is kept cool to prevent them from losing fluids through perspiration. Note the portable air conditioning units, which keep their suits cool until they are established in the cockpit. Then the pre-flight check before taxi out. With their advanced capabilities, the SR-71 can outperform any reconnaissance aircraft yet built, including the U-2 or the RB-47. Let's take a good look at it as it taxis to the runway. Overall length, 107 feet. Wingspan over 55 feet. Height with landing gear down over 18 feet. Its power plants, two Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojets with a thrust of 60,000 pounds are equal to the power of 45 locomotives. The skin is of titanium alloy to withstand extreme heat. Special tools must be used when working the skin so as not to contaminate the metal and cause corrosion. From February 1963, when the SR-71 development program was initiated, until it made its first flight at Palmdale, California, December 22, 1964, less than two years had elapsed. An extremely short development span for such a complicated military aircraft system. In-flight refueling gives the aircraft unlimited range with military distances now measured in terms of global miles and with survival depending on our ability to obtain vital information about an enemy's war-making capability, the SR-71 can play an indispensable role in strategic warfare planning. 